Uh, a very warm welcome to Brunel University London. Uh, my name is Arad Reisberg. I'm the head of Brunel Law School. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's evening debate. Um, you all know this is a very serious topic and I'm grateful for you for taking the time to, um, for anything else that you might be doing to stop, think, reflect on this important matter. Um, this event is the inaugural event of our newly created Human Rights, I need to get the name right, Human Rights Society and Art Research Group by two of my colleagues who are sitting here in the front row. So it gives me a great pleasure uh, to open this. Um, I'm now going to invite my colleague Elena Grosby, co-director of this research group, and our main speaker for tonight, Professor Javid Rahman, the UN Reporter on uh, Iran, to join me on the stage. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, Arad, for the introduction, and welcome everyone again. Uh, to the first talk show of the research group on human rights, society and arts. Uh, before we start, I want to uh, thank the, my colleague and the co-leader of the research group, Dr. Marcus de Matos, who was behind the organization of this event and make all this possible. So thank you, Marcus. And thank you, Javid, for um, joining us today and address such an important topic. So today, conversation, and we are going to uh, have this as a talk show. Uh, so it's not going to be a formal presentation, but a more an open discussion, and we really welcome your questions at the end of our first uh, 20 minutes of uh, questions from, from myself, but then we are going to open the floor and get questions from the, the, the audience. So uh, today's event is um, on a very important topic that has been on the forefront of news uh, uh, since September, unfortunately. That is the violence against women and girls. And the title of today is uh, Violence Against Women and Girls in Iran, an Unfolding Tragedy Since the Killing of Masa Amini. And it's not, uh, uh, it's not a case that we focus on that, because unfortunately on 16 September, when Masamini was killed, uh, triggered something in, in Iran, in Iran public society and public um, opinion, but also uh, make us all uh, aware of what's going on in Iran even more than before. Uh, so before we start and discuss more generally the situation of women and girls in Iran, Shavik, can you please help us understand who was Masamini and what happened to her? Thank you, Elena. Uh, before I start, uh, if I can just thank you and Marcus uh, and the law school and indeed Brunel University for organizing this very important event. I'm, I'm really honored to be here. And I thank uh, all participants uh, this evening for their time and for their um, understanding of the very serious critical situation that, that exists in Iran. Um, secondly, I want to say very quickly, I pay tribute, I appreciate all of the Iranians who are fighting an authoritarian repressive regime in Iran and we must support them. So again, um, I wish them the very best. Now in terms of uh, Gina Masamini, she was um, a 22 year old Kurdish woman who was traveling from the Kurdistan region of Iran to Tehran um, with her family. And she was stopped by the, what we call it as the morality police. And the morality police, they have this task of stopping uh, young women or, uh, or women in general uh, and uh, ensuring or assessing whether they are properly wearing the hijab. And in her case, they stopped her and they felt that she was not wearing proper hijab. Um, as you would know, and if you don't know, I'll just to explain that it is a criminal offense in Iran not to wear a proper hijab. There, there are penalties, uh, including imprisonment and fines. So this uh, young woman was pushed into a policeman and therefore and thereby she was taken into custody of the morality police. They took her to a detention center and where they claimed that uh, it was going to be a, a minor affair of re-educating her. 
But what we have uh, seen and the evidence and the testimonies that I have received is that she was beaten while she was in their custody and she died because of these uh, injuries. Um, of course, uh, the Iranian regime, uh, typical to their history and to their existence, uh, are denying and it's a cover-up scheme on their part and they're saying that there was no wrongdoing. But uh, Gina Massa died um, in police custody, in the custody of the state on the 16th of September. Uh, and the problem we have is that the Iranian authorities, as we know, they have not conducted any independent, any impartial or any objective investigation. They have simply taken their historic position that we didn't do anything wrong, uh, there was nothing wrong. It, this girl was facing pre-existing um, pre medical conditions and therefore she died. And they have denied all responsibility. And that is, in summary, what the situation was with Gina Massa. But unfortunately, we know that she was not the only one. And after her, older women suffered similar um, uh, situations. And more generally, uh, women and girls are experiencing uh, violence and discrimination in Iran, both due to the laws, like the one that you just mentioned, but also societal practices. Uh, can you please tell us more about that? Yeah, and if I can just, uh, starting from this issue of enforced hijab, um, this enforced hijab is, um, you know, it violates women's dignity and it violates their rights. And for years and for decades, women have been, you know, protesting against this policy of enforced hijab. And, and it, it's a violation of their rights because the state is imposing. It is not simply uh, a law which is not enforced. I mean, the morality police have a role to play and they were enforcing, they have been enforcing. They have been violating their dignity. And uh, the unfortunate, tragic thing is that since uh, President Ibrahim Raisi has come into power in 2021, he has taken on board, he has emphasized that it is so important for this Iranian uh, regime to enforce. Uh, he, he says that this is a, a moral agenda for him. Uh, there are new regulations that have come up. He, he signed on them. Uh, he has pressurized uh, women. There has been new technologies that are being introduced. So women, for example, when they're traveling on public transport, uh, they could be monitored. And if they are perceived as not wearing proper hijab, then they would be fined. Or, or worse still, uh, they could be barred from public transport. They could be barred from entering uh, public, uh, you know, public uh, galleries. Uh, they could be uh, stopped from entering banks. They could, uh, you know, government officials, women who work for the government, could be sacked from their jobs. So there are very serious consequences. And um, a lot of these uh, women who protest against uh, the enforced hijab, they are in fact not just charged with not, not wearing proper hijab. In many instances, they are charged with uh, national security or morality-based uh, offenses which carry very serious punishments, including, uh, for example, sometimes uh, to death. So this is a very serious uh, issue about enforced hijab. But as regards your broader question about uh, you, the violation of the rights of girls and women, there is a whole catalogue of issues. And in fact, if you look at my report of uh, January 2021, which I presented to the Human Rights Council, I noted that women and girls are second class citizens in Iran. And I will just identify a few um, areas where, where I have come to the conclusion why they are, in my view, second-class citizens. One is if you look at, for example, uh, the criminal, criminal law. Now, criminal responsibility for girls in Iran begins at the age of nine, a nine lunar calendar. What it means is that these young girls could actually be charged with offenses which carry the death penalty, like kisas, for example, killing, or hadood offenses. So at the age of nine, criminal responsibility begins for girls' uh, uh, lunar years, uh, whereas for, for boys, it starts at 15. Uh, and as I said, that they can have very serious consequences. They could be sentenced to very serious offenses. And we know that uh, some very young girls have been sentenced and executed 
over the, over the years. Then um, a related issue is about child marriages, you know. And, and you know child marriage, any child marriage is a forced marriage because the consent is not involved. Now the law in Iran is that um, a girl at the age of 13 can be married and even younger girls can be married with the consent of the father and the court. So uh, every year we see a, a rise in the number of very young girls being forced into that marriage. Then you also have a lot of issues uh, surrounding the criminal justice system. For example, there are exonerations um, by law, in criminal law, for example, uh, for fathers or grandfathers who kill their children. That is written in law. Yeah? There is also um, exonerations and exemptions for men who kill their wives uh, um, and their partners, the wife's partner, if they see them uh, in an in a adulterous uh, uh, action or, or suspected adulterous relationship. So the criminal justice system creates exemptions uh, and it, it allows, it encourages violence against women. And there are many other ways where violence against women is, is encouraged. Um, uh, there are also issues uh, in, in personal laws, in family law. For example, in, in family law, uh, women have a very subservient situation. Uh, for example, in marriage, in divorce, in custody, and in guardianship. So all of these areas, women are discriminated. If you look at other uh, areas of, uh, of Iranian law, and if you look at the, at the global situation, how, uh, how they are inter relatively in terms of the other countries. So in 2020, when I was doing my uh, report for the 2021, I noted that Iran is 183rd out of 193 countries in the global index. So it is very poor. If you look at the current political scenario or, or the people who are in charge in, in making laws or in developing policies, you would not find any woman. So for example, if you look at the position of the supreme leader, the president, the guardian council, the head of judiciary, the head of supreme court, women are not to be seen, you see. And uh, women are legislatively excluded from becoming judges in Iran, you see. Uh, so this is, uh, I mean, I think this is a very serious indictment for any state to recognize that women's situation is dire in that country. Absolutely. But then, I mean, all the picture that you just drew for us shows some structural discrimination and violence against women that absolutely date back not from the 16th of September, but well, well uh, before that. So why do you think now we, we are seeing all these protests and all these, uh, um, I mean, exacerbating of, of, of violence and, and also protests from, from both women and men in the streets of Tehran and in major uh, Iranian cities? Why now and why uh, after the death of Masamini? Yeah, no, yeah, that's a great question and thank you for asking that. And, and it's actually, uh, been uh, an important question which needs to be understood. Now, you see, uh, we've seen um, masses of protests uh, in recent years and historically, and, uh, and we have colleagues who have done uh, a lot of work, for example, on the November 2019 protests, where uh, even by a very conservative estimate, over 300 people were killed in a short space of a week. So that is a very serious in, 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 uh, incident. Um, but you're right that at that time in November 2019 or in, in previous protests, uh, we did not see that level of international you know, concern or, or a sustained uh, international concern. And, and hopefully we'll have, to, we'll have time to talk about what the international community has done. Uh, for example, we have set up an unprecedented uh, mechanism to investigate. So, so that has not happened. So your question is very legitimate. Why now? Um, there, are, there are various uh, elements to this question. One is that, you know, violence against women and the way this girl was, was brutalized, I think it touched upon all of the people of Iran. But this movement, uh, what they call it, uh, Women, Life, Freedom, uh, was triggered by young women and girls, by the younger generation. You see, they have all the aspirations which we have. So they could not accept that, you know, in 2022, uh, the state is still so repressive and it is so 
uh, you know, it's so hooked up on, on, on forcing women to wear a piece of cloth in the way they wanted to do. So it was a spontaneous movement led by young people. We haven't seen that. I mean, uh, November 2019 was a, was a very important movement, but these were economic issues. Like, for example, the, the fuel price uh, had been doubled. So people uh, were really frustrated, angry at the economic repression. But this one really touched upon all of the young people. But then the historic grievances have come at the forefront. Like, for example, uh, the ethnic and religious minorities have been suffering for a very long time. But this coincided because Gina Massa was a Kurdish girl. So the first protests started in the Kurdish regions, but it's quickly spread over. So it, is, uh, it has been a combination of factors, but now is the time that all of the people of Iran have stood up and they have said no to uh, uh, all sorts of oppressive activities by an authoritarian regime. Yeah, and indeed this, uh, I mean, this youth components give us some hope for the future in the sense of the new generation uh, standing up, but also gives a very uh, grim uh, figure of the fact that the average age of those who have been arrested is 15 years old. And indeed, as you said, like, the death of Masamini triggered lots of uh, protests, uh, but also lots of brutal repression mm. from state authorities. And some figures uh, updated to uh, the 3rd of January, uh, provided by uh, human rights organization, says that 19,200 uh, 19, people were detained, uh, 516 people were killed, uh, and uh, four young men were executed. And of course, so. From, from just a situation of uh, uh, human rights violation for women and girls, it became a more widespread uh, human rights violation affecting those who are protesting. So um, arbitrary killings, arbitrary arrest, as well as alleged inhuman and degraded treatment. Uh, so can you give us uh, a picture of, from what you know, uh, part of your mandate, what's the situation, what are the other human rights uh, uh, challenges and threats that uh, those who are protesting right now are facing in Iran? Yes, uh, I mean, you have, um, you have already mentioned the level uh, of extreme uh, repression. So people uh, arrested, detained in their thousands. So exact figures are never known in Iran because the regime uh, is, uh, is hiding those figures and, and they are shutting down, they're making every effort to, to uh, stop freedom of information. Um, for example, internet shutdown, etc. But uh, I mean, it, it, as we know that in such large numbers, mass arrests, detentions, torture in prisons, uh, killing of uh, people. I mean, you, you mentioned a figure of 458, but these are figures that you know, vary from civil society organizations. But what is true that a very large number of people have been uh, killed and a very large number of people have been uh, injured. And the, the tragedy of it all is that the Iranian regime is creating an environment of fear. They want to kill people uh, because they want uh, a repression to be the framework of how they operate. So, so the whole exercise, for example, when protest takes place, it is not to stop people protesting. It is to create an environment of fear so that people are afraid and not to come out. And that's why you would find, and certainly I have uh, received all these submissions and testimonies that Iranian security forces, which include the besieges and the, their uh, you know, intelligence and all uh, army including, they have been uh, shooting at people with live ammunition, with bird pallets, with, with tear gas, to kill them effectively. It's not to, to stop protests because we have a, a large international framework, you know, uh, there are basic principles, foundational principles, uh, which they could have uh, deployed, but that has not been the case. Again, a serious concern is, and I, I regret to say that, that they have been uh, shooting at women at very sensitive parts of their body to, to actually uh, damage them permanently. You see, it, it is so shocking. Um, they have been killing children. I mean, uh, the figures that we have is that at least 68 or 64 children have been killed by security forces. And if you 
if you investigate that further, if you want more evidence, you can have a look at the Child Rights Committee um, statements. For example, they not only condemned the killing of children, they said that they have information whereby parents are being forced to absolve the security forces uh, saying that uh, the, the children had committed suicide, for example. So it is a very uh, disturbing, harrowing picture which the world has seen. And, uh, and that's why, and that is the reason that all of the international community galvanized to establish this fact-finding mission to hold the perpetrators accountable. Because that is the ultimate justice for the people of Iran. And, I mean, focusing on, on your last point about what the UN is trying to do, and of course, I mean, like, you, you, again, you picture, uh, you draw a very uh, terrible picture of, of human rights abuses uh, going on right now. And of course, the UN, uh, for its mandate and mission, uh, is the, probably the most competent uh, institution to, to, to try to do something. And you mentioned the establishment of this fact-finding mission, but uh, is, is that been uh, effective? Or can it be effective? Or what else, what other tools the international community, and, inter and, and both in terms of the United Nations, but also maybe states, uh, what can they do uh, and what they are doing at the moment to uh, do something? No, that's, that's a great question, thank you. And actually it brings us to our, also, to our academic understanding of, uh, of uh, international human rights law and the limitations within the framework that we operate. So um, you know that the, the framework of the international human rights law is uh, established through the United Nations. And we have a general assembly and the subsidiary organ is the UN Human Rights Council, which, which is a body uh, focused and, and uh, given the task of, uh, of uh, establishing human rights. But the whole of the edifice of human rights is actually limited in terms of uh, enforceability. So there are very strong limitations into what human rights law can do. So uh, in the context of the um, Human Rights Council, you know, you have the Universal Periodic Review. Iran had its uh, periodic review in 2019, and now there's another one coming up in four and a half years. Uh, then the Human Rights Council uh, established my mandate, uh, which started in 2011, and it is a yearly mandate. So you can, you can see the sensitivity that every year I have to be there at the Human Rights Council to seek its extension, you see. And there are states which are, uh, which are opposed to my mandate. They are opposed to my existence. They are opposed to whatever I say. So it's a delicate balance within the, the human rights framework. Um, this year, because of the very dire situation, uh, the Human Rights Council has been uh, active. And I, I am grateful to them that they have, uh, they have worked with me. Uh, we have campaigned for the setting up of this uh, accountability mechanism. And it was overwhelmingly accepted by members of the Human Rights Council. Uh, the vote was uh, on 24th of November, and I think there were 25 countries which voted in favor, and uh, you, people can correct me, I think there were only uh, six, seven, or eight states opposing. So uh, setting up of this fact-finding mission is a, is a unique, positive um, uh, initiative. Um, uh, I was also invited by the Security Council to present my concerns, so I, uh, I appeared to the Security Council uh, late last year, and, and members of the Security Council listened to me, what I had to say. Likewise, I presented a report, which I normally do in the General Assembly, and annually there is, uh, there is a resolution passed uh, on Iran, uh, uh, which is led by Canada. So um, these are all the initiatives which the UN does in terms of its broader framework. Now the big question is, what, what can uh, concretely be done to change the situation? And the, the limitation is that the human rights law or the framework that we have does not or cannot authorize use of force or regime change. That is not within my mandate. That is not within the mandate of the Human Rights Council. It's not in the mandate of any agency save for the Security Council. But the Security Council, uh, of course, as you know, has five permanent members, and uh, the, the permanent members have their diametrically opposed view on, on various issues. I mean, Russia and China would have different views to the other states. 
So uh, in terms of use of force, that is not an option. Any change that would have to come would have to come from the people of Iran themselves. And uh, what we could do is, what I'm trying to do is a democratic reform in the country. And I hope that uh, in, in the days, weeks, months or years to come, uh, there would be a democratic reform. It is, it is challenging, but that is what human rights framework is. Uh, not much in terms of, uh, of a radical agenda that we can, we can put forward. Absolutely, and I think this is the, the critiques that we often hear about the uh, ineffectiveness of the UN machinery, but of course it creates this kind of like raising awareness about something and creating a institutional settings uh, within which we as a civil society we can operate. Uh, but we are hearing from, from what's going on in Iran that like, some changes are, are ongoing or, or they're just rumors about uh, small changes in the whether the morality police uh, uh, is still ongoing or not uh, or maybe abolished. I mean, do you think that something is already changing uh, or there are just uh, rumors and uh, is the, the, big, the change is still yet to come? Um, uh, again, important question. Um, since uh, this uh, unfortunate killing took place, there have been statements made by individuals, and one was made in uh, early December by the Attorney General. He said that the morality police uh, is shut down by those who set it up. But that was a very ambiguous statement. Now what we have, uh, the information we have received uh, in December, late December, is that actually nothing has happened. Uh, and in fact, um, the important thing is that uh, the enforcement of hijab is still a policy of the state. They have not said that they will no longer enforce hijab or they, they will abolish or repeal the hijab laws or any of the laws which I mentioned to you uh, which violate the rights of women. So the, the, the regime is actually built on repression and its first target is women. So regrettably, uh, and I, I say with great sorrow and pain, that they are not going to change these laws unless they are pressured into it, unless the, the whole dramatic um, scenario changes, uh, because that, that is what they're built on, you see. And so going back to it, to, to us and like to, to what can be done to, to pressure uh, them to, to, to change. Uh, what we as civil society, both as academics, uh, but also uh, or civil society organizations, uh, what, what can we do? Is there anything we can do? Because of course, it's like, differently from what happened in, in previous years. This year, this time, the international community uh, seemed to be particularly concerned. So can we uh, capitalize on this interest and do something to meaningfully help uh, Iranians uh, in this fight? Yeah, I think that uh, we can do a lot. Uh, we have done quite a lot and, and, uh, and testimony to all that is the presence of this audience and, and thank you again to, to the research center for giving this subject, uh, it's uh, due uh, share of recognition. So that's, that's important. I think that um, an important element is our understanding of prioritizing human rights, the rights of all human beings, regardless of, uh, of their gender, regardless of their background, regardless of, um, of whatever considerations they may be. Because what we often find is that in the, in the competition between economic and political interest vis-a-vis -vis human rights, the international community gives priority to other considerations, not to human rights. And therefore, I think it's very important that we focus on human rights. But it's also important that we have objective standards of human rights. So when we talk about uh, women's rights, we talk about women's rights everywhere, you see. We don't forget that uh, Iran is one country with, uh, with an oppressive regime, but there are many others. So if we have to be genuine, there has to be a genuine commitment towards improving uh, the position of girls and women in all parts of the world. It cannot just be a, a political, you know, political initiative. The other key element, again, should come from within us, is the, is the oneness and the commonality of individuals. That women and men, they have the same rights and they have the same aspirations. 
we cannot hide behind religious relativism to say, okay, well, in Islam, that's okay. Or, well, in that culture, in that tradition, that's okay. I mean, there are certain essential rights which are the core of human dignity. And I, I mean, a great uh, document is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I, I hope that people will have time to, to read that. So we have to believe in that oneness, in the core value of the human dignity and not allow or hide behind this religious relativism, which I often come across. And in the case of Iran, they, have, they, they always say, oh, it's, Islamic uh, it's an Islamic regime. Is Islamic law that we follow? No, it isn't. I mean, there are 53 countries which, which are part of the OIC members. They are all Islamic. They say they, many of them follow Sharia. So um, they, don't, uh, you know, they don't execute child offenders, for example. They don't uh, torture. They don't uh, flog uh, people. They don't amputate hands and feet. Uh, they don't have um, executions, for example, on the basis of alcohol consumption written in their law. Or they don't have vague uh, offenses, like, for example, just last year, over 500 people were executed in Iran, you see. So this is not, this cannot be permitted just because the state says, oh, this uh, Islam says that. So that is my message. I think this is absolutely needed message, considering that lots of people will conflate Islamic law or Islamic is Islam informed law with all the human rights abuses that we're seeing in Iran. So it's absolutely important to, to distinguish the two things and not allow, uh, as you said, religious, uh, religious relativism claims to justify human rights threats. Thank you very much, Javid. And uh, of course, we could have stayed here uh, so much longer in uh, getting more questions and trying to understand better all the uh, uh, situation in Iran, but more generally, we, we touch upon so many issues related to human rights, universality, relativism, women's rights around the world. But of course, today we're focusing on Iran, and I really want to thank again all the Iranian people here in the room today who share with us your, your, your experience. Uh, we're really with you, and we will do, I mean, as, the, as a research group, but I guess as, the, as Brunel University, we are here to stand with you, and we'll, we'll try to do our best to continue raise awareness and give you a forum for, uh, for keeping this fight on. So thank you very much. Thank you to the audience and uh, thank you, Jacques. Thank you. Thank you, Elena.